I warmly welcome everybody to today's Bussell Institute webinar entitled EU GCC Cooperation on the Energy Transition. Strong global action on energy transition is essential for sustainable development and growth, as well as for global security. The global community is currently engaged in extensive efforts to limit the impact of carbon emissions and realize the adoption of sustainable, renewable energy sources, while at the same time supplying the worldwide economy with the energy it needs to maintain economic growth and development. For countries across both the EU and the GCC regions, the energy transition has become a key priority. With efforts directed at increasing the use of renewable energy, decreasing carbon emissions, and harnessing technology for energy efficiency. The Gulf states are focusing on supporting long-term stability through innovation and the development of knowledge-based economies. While the EU is focused on delivering a new resource-efficient growth strategy, where economic growth is decoupled from carbon-based energy use. It is a common misapprehension that the EU and the Gulf states are on different sides of this argument, that one is introducing a new Green Deal designed to reduce all carbon-based energy, while the other relies on continued production from carbon energy sources. These are some of the common misconceptions that Bussola is working to change through building bridges of understanding and cooperation between the EU and GCC to meet common global challenges. Both regions may have different perspectives, but they also have common goals. Cooperation in innovation and technology directed at the energy transition and sustainable energy is a key area <clears throat> for further strengthening EU GCC partnerships, where both regions have their own significant strengths in knowledge and experience. Indeed, both the potential and the need for more robust collaboration have been accelerated by COVID-19, which has created a momentum for closer partnerships between Europe and the Gulf in pursuing mutually advantageous innovation in this area. The concerns and opportunities arising from the energy transition offer a platform on which Europe and the Gulf can build even stronger relationships through shared technological innovation and common action, not just by governments, but by all stakeholders. Therefore, Bossela is delighted today to bring together our panel of experts from both regions to explore some of the significant but complex and varied challenges facing the countries of the EU and the GCC in taking action to support the energy transition and in further developing the cooperation necessary to ensure sustainable growth and development into the future. I would like at this stage to introduce Mr. Angus Turner, uh, our first panelist. Angus, you're very, very welcome here today. Yeah. Angus uh, is uh, just by way of introduction. Angus is a director of Smith Turner, a UK based consultancy company. He's a specialist who focuses on media relations, political risk, security analysis, and strategic communications. Indeed, Angus is a very good friend of mine and of the Bussola Institute for quite a number of years. He served in Brussels as our Director of Communications, Media, and Events Management for over two years. And he continues to work very closely with us from his Oxford base. Angus will address the points made in the recently published uh, Bussola paper, COVID-19 
oil price contraction and energy transition, implications for the Gulf states and Europe, which uh, Angus authored for us. Over to you, Angus, and thank you very much. It's brilliant to have you here with us. Thank you very much, John. I'm uh, I'm going to I'm going to use a, a quick PowerPoint presentation to um, to go through my uh, the various points in the paper. So I'm just going to share my screen, and I hope this will all work. There we are. Good. Um, good morning, everybody. It's very good to be back with Bursala. It always is. Uh, and John, thank you very much indeed for for preparing the ground. Um, for this, I think, really interesting area, which um, Bussela has been focusing on now for uh, the past three and a half years, really, since, since Bussela's inception in Brussels. Um, I think I, I want to make sort of a few points um, over, the next, uh, over the next few minutes, really trying to highlight um, the main points that were drawn in the paper that John has just mentioned. Um, and then leading into perhaps a broader discussion um, about how the EU and the GCC can cooperate and indeed mutually benefit uh, from the process of energy transition. But I wanted to start really by, by talking, and John to some extent has already alluded to this, um, about the sort of mismatch of perceptions uh, about uh, the various um, aspects of the relationship between the EU and the GCC, particularly in the area of energy. And I think the first thing I would, I would say and the paper says is that there is a perception still widely uh, shared in, in Europe, particularly in the sort of less knowledgeable quarters of Europe, that the Gulf remains awash with oil, uh, is hugely wealthy and is, is really pretending that nothing has changed. Um, and that this, as John says, sits uh, the Gulf at odds with the EU's um, ambitions for its new Green Deal um, and for climate addressing climate change generally. There's also an opposite uh, perception, which I think sometimes uh, enters this conversation uh, too strongly. And that is about, that concerns the process of, of energy transition. And it's almost as though energy transition has already happened and that oil was somehow something in the past um, and that the entire focus, particularly in the Gulf, is now on new areas of economic activity and, uh, and, and, the, and the reliance on energy, energy is, uh, is no longer there. So this paper um, aims or tries to first of all situate where we are today uh, in terms of what the position is vis-a-vis energy transition and how far down the road we've got with that transition. Secondly, it tries to explore what the impacts are, uh, as John has just mentioned, of uh, both climate change and more recently COVID-19 uh, on that um, transition. And finally, it, it looks at um, areas where we believe that there are is genuine uh, opportunities for improved cooperation uh, between both the European Union and the Gulf. Why is that not transitioning? There we are. I think, as I said, the first thing to, to say is, is really to talk about, about this mismatch of perceptions. Um, I've mentioned the issue of, of, of Gulf oil wealth, and it's still quite common to, to read in, in various newspapers and articles about the Gulf that they are still essentially rentier economies, i.e. economies which are dependent almost entirely upon the production and sale of, of their energy, um, and that they allow uh, other partners to come in, um, exploit the, the energy assets in, in underneath the Gulf, um, and essentially that they rely on the benefits of, of renting out that capacity, which of course is, is, is arguably something that might have been true to a large extent in the past, but increasingly less so. And Daniel Jurgen, who famously wrote the book The Prize, uh, and indeed late last year uh, published a new, new book called The, uh, the New Map, which is, addresses this whole subject in considerable depth, talks about the looming reality of change uh, and the impact that 
climate change, North American competition, and renewable alternatives to oil um, are already having on, uh, on demand for, for energy and on the economies, particularly the Gulf, but not just the Gulf, around the world as well. There's a big question about whether COVID-19 is going to accelerate this entire process of shift. And I think, there's, again, there's been a certain tendency in the, in the media in recent months uh, in talking about uh, energy production in the Gulf to suggest that COVID-19 is likely to accelerate this process. And again, that's something which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, and then finally, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about the programmes of economic transformation um, which are common to all six members of the Gulf Corporation Council and which are largely based on the opportunities being afforded by the Industrial Revolution. And the first thing to say, uh, and the paper says this at some, some length, is actually the energy outlook for, um, for the foreseeable future is, is quite interesting. Um, first of all, uh, as many of you will know, BP produces an annual um, energy review, uh, which offers a sort of quite comprehensive snapshot of where the globe is going in terms of its energy consumption. Um, and it sets out various scenarios, uh, some more optimistic and some more pessimistic in terms of um, both the transition to away from uh, fossil, -based, fossil based fuels um, and uh, and, and, and it, it tests the various scenarios against, um, against different factors. And it's, I thought it was interesting um, that this, the most recent one published last September, makes the key point that global energy demand, total energy demand continues to grow, driven by an increasing prosperity in the living standards in the emerging world. In essence, what, what BP is making the point and the International Energy Agency makes the same point is that if you look at this colorful graph down on the right hand corner here, you will see that the total demand for energy from 1990 until now, so essentially over the last 30 years, has grown and grown quite significantly. Uh, the measure on the left is, is tons of oil equivalents. So it's all based against, uh, against the, um, the output of oil. And if you've got keen eyes, you will see that basically those top blue lines are coal and gas. The bottom layer is oil itself. The green, thin green line in the middle is nuclear and the very narrow turquoise line right in the middle is renewable energy, um, as, in, as in wind, um, tide, etc. cetera. Um, so the message is the world is continuing to consume enormous amounts of fossil fuels and hydrocarbons and that that um, demand um, has not diminished. So not only are we faced by a need to address climate change in terms of altering the usage of hydrocarbons, but we're also addressing it against a background of rising demand. And that is significant for the Gulf. Because BP suggests, uh, and the, sorry, the IEA suggests that the Gulf will continue to produce 45% of the hydrocarbon energy being consumed by the world in 2050. So that's 30 years away from now. So any suggestion that the Gulf is suddenly going to stop producing oil and gas is, is in the next 30 years is probably wide of the mark. And even in the BP's most green scenario in its latest report, oil still represents 20% of total energy consumption in the world. So we can see that the EU's ambition for its, its new Green Deal and so on has quite a tall, um, uh, has a lot to go to, to get there. There is, a, having said that, there is significant impact of climate change on Gulf producers. There is an element of falling demand, and there's obviously key fear about falling demand, and I suspect my colleagues will say more about that in a moment. There is arguably, therefore, a loss of strategic leverage in terms of how energy is used as a means of uh, influencing and asserting the Gulf's influence around the world. 
arguably this is, is this is encouraging the strategic pivot that we are seeing at the moment away from the Gulf's focus on the West and more towards Asia. And only yesterday, uh, some of you will have noted the, the, the sort of Monday, sorry, the, the launch of the Murban new oil futures contract uh, released in, in Abu Dhabi, which is very much focused on trying to increase sales of energy um, to the uh, to Asia and to take, a, take advantage, early advantage of the Asian market. There is broad acceptance, I think, that prices are unlikely to turn, return to their above $100 peaks that we saw at the turn of the century. But China is committed to carbon neutrality. Um, so that's going to act as a, as a if, if China is able to achieve this, a significant um, downward pressure on, on the Gulf's uh, output. And I think the crucial thing to take note of is that the all the vision programs um, all envisage the uh, or accept that long-term dependence on energy, on, on hydrocarbon energy, is not sustainable. If you're going to have a, uh, a viable um, Saudi Arabia or Oman economically in 100 years' time, they cannot depend on energy in the way that they have done over the past 50 years. As Mohammed, uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed said in, a, in an address in, in March 2017, the future will not come from oil. COVID-19 has certainly had an impact in the Gulf, and we're, we're as, as it has for all of us. Um, but I would suggest a few, just a few points uh, that the paper explores in more detail. Um, the first is that it has increased the focus on climate change, um, because as people have focused on the on the need to address the urgent need to address the pandemic. So people have also started to lift their eyes uh, in the Gulf, um, just as in Europe, to the looming uh, threat that climate change arguably um, poses for the world. Um, and to some extent it's, it's emphasized or put further emphasis on the economic vulnerability of the Gulf. Um, in 2020, there was a, a fall in demand for oil of on average of 8.4 million barrels per day. And the IMF noted uh, in its most recent report that the, um, the GDP is contracted in the Gulf by 6.6% last year. And the IMF predicts that it's unlikely that the Gulf economies as a total will return to their pre-crisis trend line. Uh, for at least another 10 years. So all of these are, so COVID is acting as an accelerator of change. And I would argue that, that COVID, while I suspect its impact in, in historical terms may not be that significant, I think in terms of changing people's attitudes and approaches, I think it has acted or will act as, as an accelerator and driver, because I think it's going to focus people's attention more intently um, on the need for change that I've already outlined. So just in summary, what does this possibly mean for the future of each EU Gulf relations? Well, there's a few points to make note at the top in terms of what is actually going on now. First of all, there's the factor of the perceived US withdrawal. We know that the US itself has, has, has reduced its military commitments, its strategic commitments to, to the region. And this is creating strategic space into which the rising powers of Asia are certainly are certainly moving. We've seen this in, in uh, only this week in, in the tour of the Gulf of, uh, of Wang Yi, the foreign minister of China. Um, we see regular uh, engagement with India and so on and so forth. And all the Gulf states are looking more towards Asia, I would suggest, than they are towards the West for their future economic well-being. And that has an impact for the EU, because the EU could also, if it moved now or in the near future, into that same space that the US arguably is creating. And I think one of the aspects, I'm sure we'll discuss this Either, uh, either now or in, later in questions, is the issue of the need for a free trade agreement between the GCC and the EU. It's been on the stocks now for a long time, it, uh, it, but talks uh, stalled in 2008, 
um, for various reasons um, and various efforts to, to re encourage and re-incentivize um, people's interest in this have, have not been, um, has so far not been forthcoming. So this is a serious live issue which the European Union um, and the GCC arguably need to, to, to close with and make progress on. The European Union should look at the Gulf's vision programs and take these seriously because these are creating big opportunities that not just in terms of trade, but in terms of shared experience, in terms of common ambition. Um, and I think one of the things that COVID uh, has emphasized is actually the geographic proximity of the Gulf states and the European Union. They are not very far apart. And I think really my closing message uh, out of the paper is that the European Union and the Gulf states have an opportunity now, encouraged by COVID-19 to some extent, and certainly based on, on the, uh, the climate change um, agenda, which of course is, is, is rapidly rising up the scale of, of, of international tension, to actually come together and do something really meaningful together. I'll, shut, I'll, I'll close my remarks here um, and very happy to come back in questions later. Thank you very much, Angus. And indeed, we will be coming back <clears throat> to some of the issues you've raised and to others later. Uh, and we look forward to that. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, our second uh, panelist today is Dr. Irina Kustova. And again, Irina is a good friend of Bussela's. She has been to many of our events in Square the Muse, and uh, as indeed have some of her colleagues. Uh, Irina is a researcher at the Centre for European Policy Studies, CEPS, in Brussels, where she works on a range of issues relating to the energy transition and energy security. Irina has previously held positions with the Energy Charter Secretariat, the Agency for the Cooperation of Energy Regulators, and the Delegation of the European Union to Russia. She has been a visiting research fellow at the King's College London and the Energy Research Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Her work has appeared widely or appears widely in leading academic journals. Irina will speak to us today about the range of policies and actions of the European Union in support of the energy transition. Thank you very much, Irina. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much John, for this uh, very detailed introduction and uh, I'm glad to speak today at this event, a really uh, interesting and very pressing topics and cooperation is, uh, is really a very actual topic these days between the European Union and the Gulf countries. And uh, well, in the beginning I would like to reflect a bit on uh, what Angus uh, told us today. And maybe my general remarks will uh, be related to uh, the question of how energy transition is actually affecting and will affect international affairs, international politics and uh, states um, uh, in the international arena. And of course, uh, well, it's reflected on the title of Angus paper. It's about oil prices and Actually, one year ago, there was a, a big debate whether this is the end of, of oil when we got negative oil prices and whether it, how it will affect the climate agenda. And uh, the main question is whether power of oil, oil is still relevant these days. And maybe uh, to quote uh, Mark Twain, the reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. And uh, for the climate agenda, maybe this is not so good news that yes, oil price is increasing, maybe not as fast as in the past, but it's increasing. And oil demand is still here as Angus showed in his presentation. And also if we check uh, now the ECG, uh, requirements and uh, whether investors actually adhere to the CCG requirements, uh, well, we would see that some of them really would uh, prefer some fast profits 
in comparison to divesting oil assets. But this is a, uh, this is a short term, maybe mid term observations. And uh, moving to a bit longer term perspective, of course, uh, the picture is not so bright for oil. And uh, when we check the US uh, recovery package, which has such big sums that I'm even afraid to pronounce them. <laughs> These huge sums are devoted to recovery of national economy. And we can, maybe we can guess that dollar will uh, likely to observe some weakening. And even if oil price will rise, will rise uh, in the future, will continue to rise. <laughs> the costs for producers will also increase at least a bit. And my observation would be that high oil prices are quite favorite for importers to switch from oil. And high oil prices, higher oil prices will stimulate uh, transition. And this is also the case of the European Union where uh, the Green Deal actually is uh, stipulates that we need to phase out co uh, coal, we need to phase out oil, we need to move away from gas. And uh, in, the, in the longer term for the green economy, the news I would say is quite good. And uh, the trend will continue, energy transition is here and it will stay with us no matter uh, what will be oil price in the future. And coming back to coming to my second point is about uh, is carbon price a new oil price, and can can it uh, replace oil price as a symbolical institution, a symbolical international institution in the future? Well, in the short term, of course, this is a bit premature. The European Union has a, a well functioning. Uh, ETS system, other countries are also moving in this direction. They have their own domestic ETS or carbon pricing systems. But uh, the question is uh, that in maybe in a couple of decades, we are likely to see a kind of emerging global, maybe uh, resulted from linking different ETS systems to one another. And of course, any replacement of international institution, and I'm speaking about an informal institution as oil price, of course, it increases a bit of turbulence in international relations. This is quite, uh, it was observed many times in uh, international relations, but um, that's also a trend that we are having now. And then I'm coming to my third, and this is last observation. This is about geopolitics and how what actually energy transition will do with geopolitics and relations between states. And uh, we lived, we are still living in a fossil fuel world where energy security is about affordable energy and security of supplies. And we used to think about uh, energy politics as relations between energy producers and consumers. And they're often very, very different interests. And my point would be that actually energy transition is changing very significantly these relations and the very interdependence between the countries. New supply chains will appear. Later we can speak about hydrogen, maybe, maybe batteries, and batteries is already a big, a big game, geopolitical game in the world. And that actually new supply chains will create new values and they are likely to be not more in uh, upstream but more in a downstream and new business and financial models will be created and that will open windows of opportunities for cooperation among different countries and among the gulf countries and this is the moment that would be my key uh, key argument today this is exactly the moment when new supply chains are being created and being formed this is a moment for the eu and gcc countries uh, just to open a dialogue and start exploring new opportunities. Because as you, as you know, the European Union uh, adheres to the Green Deal and it means that by 2050, the, the Union should become carbon neutral, climate neutral. And even if the European Union uh, is responsible for one tenth of global emissions, 
worldwide, it's just one, even less than 10% of emissions. And cooperation with uh, other countries is essential. And this year, there will be a lot of debates uh, in Glasgow in the end of this year. And uh, this is a very pressing moment also for the European Union to be able to gather those who adhere to energy transition to climate neutrality together and to come up with something tangible. And uh, I think for this moment, uh, that's all. And later, I think I may speak a bit more in details about uh, the European Union's uh, policies and actually how we would like to achieve this climate neutrality. Great, great, Irina. Thank you very much indeed. That was, was super. And now we turn to our final panelist, uh, Dr. Aisha Al Sarihi. And Aisha, who is originally from Oman, is a research associate at the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Riyadh. Saudi Arabia, where she focuses on the environment, energy policy, and climate economics and policies. Uh, uh, she is a non-resident fellow with the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Uh, Aisha was the coordinator for the T20 Task Force on Climate Change and Environment for the G20 Presidency of Saudi Arabia. She has been a postdoctoral researcher at the London School of Economics and Political Sciences Middle East Centre and a visiting scholar at the Georgetown uh, University Centre for Contemporary Arab Studies. So today Aisha will outline some of the main policies and actions of the Gulf states in support of the energy transition. Over to you now Aisha and thank you and you're very, very welcome. Thank you very much, John, for this introduction. It's uh, my great pleasure to join the panel today. And I'm very happy to share and reflect on what is going on in terms of the energy transition in the uh, Gulf Arab states. Um, as Angus mentioned, uh, when we think about the Gulf Arab states, we think about the abundance of the hydrocarbon resources. And perhaps we don't really think much about uh, the development of alternative energy resources, but uh, I'm here like to uh, give a, um, uh, a clear picture of what is going on in here. So uh, the Gulf Arab states uh, actually, despite the abundance of the hydrocarbon resources, have joined uh, the global forces in developing alternative and clean energy resources like the wind, solar, hydrogen as well as uh, actually working on cleaning the conventional energy system uh, through scaling up the use of the carbon uh, capture and storage technologies, um, enhancing energy efficiency programs, as well as adopting waste to energy technologies. So for, for the Gulf countries, there are uh, many drivers and opportunities for them to embark on developing alternative uh, energy uh, resources. Uh, if we speak about some of the internal drivers, um, so first of all, there is abundance of renewable energy resources in the region, especially the solar and the wind. And then uh, energy security is also uh, one of the issues uh, that is uh, looming on the horizon for some of the Gulf countries. And this is why, um, so some of the Gulf countries like Kuwait, uh, 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 Roman, have started to import uh, natural gas to meet the increasing demand uh, for the energy. So uh, this is also one of the reasons to uh, develop uh, the renewable energy or alternative energy technologies. Um, uh, the other thing is also, uh, as also Angus mentioned, um, and as John mentioned as well, uh, is there is uh, the motivation and the aspiration to diversify the economy away from the oil um, and uh, to create jobs uh, from alternative uh, uh, economic sectors. So these are some of the internal drivers. And there, there are also some uh, external drivers for the GCC uh, to develop the renewables and to join the global forces on the um, uh, energy transition. And uh, of course, also climate change uh, is one of the reasons uh, and all of the GCC countries are actually signatories and they ratified uh, the Paris Agreement. 
Um, and that is uh, in the recognition that climate change uh, is also like any other parts in the world is really affecting the Gulf countries uh, in terms of the uh, rise in the temperature, the sea level rise, uh, and also in terms of uh, uh, the extreme weather events, uh, especially the heat waves and the dust storms and the floods. Uh, so these, so for the Gulf countries to join the global forces in tackling climate change is also going to be beneficial for the region itself. And uh, in terms of the impact of, on the oil sector, although um, there are a lot of uncertainties in there, but uh, I, I can say that there is a lot of um, awareness and recognition uh, on how uh, the Gulf countries uh, would like to uh, address those uncertainties uh, in the future. So, uh, and briefly, I would like to reflect uh, a little bit on the uh, energy transition activities and what is going on in, in, in this region. So, uh, all of the Gulf countries so far, they have uh, targets for renewable energy and the energy efficiency uh, to maximize uh, the, uh, um, or to uh, diversify the energy mix. And in fact, uh, just uh, as a figure, uh, actually between 2018, uh, sorry, 2014 and 2020, uh, the installed capacity for renewable energy in the power sector have increased from 210 megawatt uh, uh, for the whole region to something uh, of uh, uh, over 2000 megawatt by the end of two. Uh, 2019, um, and also uh, perhaps we wouldn't think that the Gulf countries are doing uh, some efforts in reducing their carbon emissions, uh, but uh, so far Saudi Arabia and Oman have set targets to reduce uh, their uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so for Saudi Arabia, uh, it mentioned in its uh, NDC that it will uh, cut uh, 130 million tons of carbon dioxide by 2030. Oman also uh, uh, set a target to reduce the emissions by 2% uh, between 2020 and 2030, uh, compared to two, uh, 1994. Uh, the UAE uh, this year actually has submitted an enhanced national determined contribution report to the UNFCCC. And they also, uh, along with the, uh, in, uh, increasing the renewable energy targets, they also set uh, a, a carbon emission cut target, which is 23.5% uh, uh, to, to be uh, cutting the emissions uh, through to 2030 compared to the business as usual scenario. Also in the region, there is um, a, a momentum to adopt the, uh, the hydrogen technology in here. So uh, uh, I'm sure like maybe you, you are aware of this uh, Saudi Arabia uh, NEOM uh, project that has announced a uh, 5 billion Saudi green hydrogen plant uh, 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 to be powered by uh, renewable energy of something of four gigawatt. Um, and also uh, uh, Oman as well has also announced uh, a project, a hydrogen project on the Dakhom uh, industrial zone. Um, and um, um, yeah, and, and also uh, one major thing that I also would like to mention uh, uh, also, uh, so when, when we think about the Gulf countries, we think uh, about the abundance of the oil and maybe a reluctance to adopt alternatives but uh, since the Saudi Arabia has been the president uh, for the G20 last year, uh, it has uh, um, uh, adopted a, a carbon, a circular carbon economy approach. Uh, and that is uh, to make sure that the production and the consumption of the oil doesn't happen at the expense of the environment and the climate, uh, where uh, it make sure uh, that it will cut the, the greenhouse gas emissions along the value chain of uh, hydrocarbon uh, production and consumption. And uh, I'll stop here. 
Thank you very much, Aisha. In fact, the three of you have presented such a wealth of material that we could have 500 questions. We're not going to have that much time. We have about 20 minutes, so we'll take some. Angus, I'm going to look uh, just, there are lots of questions I'd love to ask you about COVID and results and so on, and we may if we've time. But just one or two that strikes me that maybe are coming at this from a slightly different angle. Uh, how does nuclear energy fit into the drive to decarbonize energy uh, production and ensure environmental product, uh, uh, protection, in your view, Angus? Well, as you know, the, the, um, the UAE commenced a, um, a nuclear energy program um, with uh, you know, considerable ambition um, about 10 years ago. Um, late last year, after a number of delays, the first um, of four reactors came on stream at the Baraka plant in, in Abu Dhabi. Um, and so far, it's the only, um, only nuclear uh, plant outside Iran in the whole of the, uh, the MENA region. So in terms of its contribution uh, in terms of its immediate contribution, it's, it's, it's clearly relatively small. Um, having said that, the, the Gulf states have all, uh, have all indicated an aspiration to make nuclear um, part of the energy mix. Nuclear, of course, has the great advantage that it's, 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 it doesn't produce carbon. Um, but of course, it's a great disadvantage is that it's, um, it, it comes with a number of issues to do with, with dual use uh, in terms of military terms, as well as uh, en uh, civilian energy terms. It, um, it creates waste, which has to be disposed of. Um, and as we saw, where are we, 10 years on almost, almost exactly, uh, the uh, Fukushima disaster in Japan shows that one has to be quite careful about how um, how plants are, are looked after and secured and everything else. So the problem with nuclear, I think, is that it's it it it, it does have a place. Um, it clearly um, it brings with it quite a lot of interesting. Um, it, it meets, I think, the Gulf some of the Gulf states' ambitions for creating, as as Aisha was just saying, for creating alternative. Uh, job opportunities. Um, it, it, it creates a driver for technological change. So it has other advantages apart from just producing energy. Um, and the, certainly the, the, the UAE has, has very much gone down the road of being immensely responsible in the way that it has gone about um, developing its nuclear program. It signed a one, two, three agreement with the United States. Um, it doesn't produce, and it's committed to not producing any of its own uh, initial nuclear material, so it doesn't enrich anything. Um, its nuclear waste is disposed of away from the UAE. Uh, so it's not as though there, is, there's, there are very few areas, in fact, as far as I'm aware, almost no uh, areas where the UAE could be accused of, of, of sort of uh, trying to use um, nuclear material for anything other than what it is intended for, which is to create energy. But in broad terms, it's interesting, isn't it, that the, the world seems to be moving away from nuclear energy because the downside risks of it are so high. Um, and I, mean, I think it's, it was just as an aside, I used to live in Scotland and Dune Ray was commissioned as a nuclear reactor, oh, back in about 1948 or something. It's taken, it was in, in, in service for about 40 years. It's still take, taken, I think now, 25 years to decommission the reactor. And they're still in the process of decommissioning it. So it's not a straightforward business, nuclear power. And, um, and while there is um, you know, considerable uh, investment in it still in, um, in the EU, and particularly in places like France, um, it's also not without its its difficulties, as we saw as we saw with the dramatic decision by Germany to move away from uh, nuclear energy. Uh, so, I think it has its place. I can imagine that uh, uh, certainly Saudi. Uh, I'm sure Asia probably has has something to say about this, um, and a number of other Gulf states 
are interested, but they're also very acutely aware of the um, of the challenges and the security issues that arise from nuclear. Great, thank you very much, Angus. I'll come back to you again in a few minutes. Uh, I just to go back to Irina for a second, and maybe to look at what the, the, the description of our, our, our webinar today of the title of it, EU GCC cooperation. And in the, based on your experience, uh, where would you like to see more cooperation between the EU and the GCC on the green agenda? Okay, thank you for this question. And uh, well, actually it's just a, a small reminder that the Green Deal is actually is a logical extension of all previous policies. So this is not something new out of nowhere. This is an extension of the energy union of the previous commissions, the 2020 targets uh, set up more than a decade ago. And the main goal is about mainstreaming climate in all policies. So to align all policies, existing policies to climate objectives. And speaking about the Green Deal, we can speak about mostly all policies, starting from energy, mobility, buildings, agriculture, industry, everything. And this opens a wide range of opportunities for the dialogue with the Gulf countries. Uh, if to reply um, with some, well, with a, to give a bit more precise answer, I would like to see some, some actions between the European Union and the Gulf countries, something tangible and measurable, you know, to start speaking about climate and energy transition. And I think that uh, any dialogue on missing leakages, given uh, the EU missing strategy, uh, the European Union is uh, taking a lot of attention to this and will elaborate a lot of on how to prevent and how to tackle these uh, leakages, both uh, within the European Union and with international partners. And I know that uh, the Gulf countries are really working on it and investing in it. Qatar Petroleum uh, commits, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to the CCS uh, uh, on its ter new terminals. So. Uh, to supply, for example, green LNG. And even if, yes, we have a transition from fossil fuels, but I think green LNG is also a good start to speak about something. And uh, then, of course, it's a bit of hype. And in the European Union, it's a hype, hydrogen, green hydrogen. But this is a good opportunity, actually, to explore. And Aisha mentioned that Saudi Arabia announced these very impressive plans to build, actually, huge capacities for hydrogen production. And these are kind of building blocks that can come uh, to something more maybe more structured in cooperation. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Irina. And I will, I'll return to you, Aisha, for a minute, just uh, something that Irina said there about, uh, you know, what individual or different or uh, individual GCC countries are doing. Are we seeing any real or strong coordinated or cooperative action between the different Gulf states in response to uh, energy transition? Sure, uh, so thanks very much for the question. Uh, so indeed the Gulf, each Gulf country individually is doing a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think each Gulf country is setting the example for itself because of the differences in their economic, political, uh, and the environmental conditions and how they are impacted also by the climate change is really different from one country to another. But in terms of the cooperation uh, between the Gulf countries, uh, actually, in fact, my, uh, myself uh, and my colleague, Mary Lumi, actually, we drafted a, a paper on that. Uh, we assessed uh, the strength and the weaknesses uh, on the ongoing uh, uh, climate and environmental cooperation uh, in the Arab region. Uh, and we uh, also analyzed the situation in the uh, Gulf region. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the Gulf region have the institutional architecture in place uh, to serve the uh, cooperation when it comes to the energy transition, climate change, and the environment. 
they also have some other platforms to also to cooperate with other regions, not only uh, within the region itself. Um, the, what I can reflect on or, or what I can mention, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council itself, uh, it has a committee on the climate change and uh, this committee is sitting the general regulation uh, on the environment. Um, and also another platform is the GCC interconnected uh, grid. So this one, uh, the idea of this interconnected grid has started back in the 1980s, uh, but it started operating in 2019. And the reason behind uh, building this interconnected grid is to enhance the energy security, especially at times of the blackouts. Uh, and so I think this uh, also can be taken a, a step further and enhance the cooperation when it comes to developing the renewable energy and the hydrogen and find out uh, where the countries can cooperate. Um, also, there, there is a, 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 a platform which is the EU GCC Clean Energy Technology Network. Um, uh, so I, I, I follow a lot of uh, talks that uh, mm -hmm. they do uh, in between the EU and the G GCC, which is a really good platform for sharing the knowledge uh, between the regions. And also most recently, we have uh, heard about a new initiative uh, here in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, which is the Middle East Green Initiative, which has been uh, launched uh, in the last few days. So the idea between uh, uh, the idea behind this green initiative is to enhance the cooperation between Saudi Arabia and the other GCC countries, as well as other Middle East countries. Uh, at the moment, the, the main focus of this initiative is to um, uh, increase the uh, reforestation. Uh, and the tree planting in the region as a, a way uh, to address the issues of the climate change and the air pollution uh, in the region. Um, and I think I would stop here. There are some other like uh, actually entities, uh, but not really focused on the energy transition, but on the uh, environmental cooperation between the GCC and the other. Uh, but uh, maybe for the sake of time, I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much, Need It's hugely reassuring to know that so many things are happening in a coordinated way, because that's not something that we're always aware of. Irene, I'll come back to you briefly, uh, just for a, a, a brief answer to this one. It just struck me that all over the world, pre-COVID, young people were marching uh, all over the world, marching on parliaments and protesting in relation to climate change and indeed calling for faster action on clean energy transition. What role do you think that our young people, our next generation should have in this energy transition project? And I said, just a brief answer. I know you could write a book on this, but. Yes, indeed. Well, a very short answer is of course that young people should play a bigger role as all of us actually. And uh, I think the main, uh, well, the main idea is actually about education. And I think that the young generation, the younger generation, they, they are changing. Uh, they are changing in regards that they get used to um, sustainable consumption ideas and they like these sustainable consumption ideas. And um, I think that continuing education, continuing uh, involving young people and explaining them the challenges that we are facing. This is a very important. Uh, this is a very important uh, um, exercise. And from young people, uh, I see that uh, well, they are very much. They are becoming very much engaged in these ideas, and they differ even from my generation. Who, who we grow up with some ideas of overconsumption, which was imposed on us uh, from all commercials and so on. So more role, more engagement, this is short answer. Great, thank you very much indeed. Angus, uh, COVID without question, I'm sure has slowed down energy, the energy transition project as indeed COVID has slowed down many things. In your view, do you think that 
uh, the pandemic is likely to have a negative impact on funding for the energy transition, particularly maybe in the short to medium term. Um, the sh probably the short answer is yes. Uh, I think, as I said in my in my presentation earlier, the and I think we're all aware that the both the um, uh, economies of the U European Union and of the GCC have shrunk as a result. They've shrunk significantly um, as a result of the impact of COVID nineteen. Um, so there's going to have to be a reprioritization of of where money is allocated. Now, having said that, there's obviously also the um, the EU's major stimulus recovery fund, it's 750 um, billion package that's in addition to the uh, multi-annual fin financial framework of the EU um, that was agreed by, by leaders last summer. And I think if you take, if, if part of that is taken uh, and coupled with um, ambitions for the, for the Green Deal uh, and to bring about the transition we're talking about, then it's possible, it's possible that that could be um, something that could actually benefit from, from COVID. But my, my worry is actually that, that near and mean politics are going to intervene in this. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we've just seen, or we're watching the sort of punch up over vaccines and so on, um, which, so I think you could never really take away the, the here and now problems. I think it's always very easy to sort of have these rather sort of grand ideas that somehow things are going to, to, to this, is, this is a great opportunity to demonstrate something marvellous, but then sort of, you know, the narrow, the narrow, nearer politics of the situation intervene. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just as, as a sort of closing point, I, I would, in terms of the Gulf, I think it's, it is worth re-emphasising that these, um, these programmes of transition that the that all the vision programs that all six of the Gulf Cooperation Council states are embarked on, um, these are genuine. These are not just these are not just advertising. Mm -hmm. These are genuine because I think every single leadership in the Gulf understands that that carbon fuels, carbon hydrocarbons, are a, an asset that is eventually going to be a stranded asset. Eventually, they'll not be able to use it unless they use their wealth now to transition. Um, they will not achieve uh, the long-standing well-being of their countries in the future. And I think that's really important that people understand that. This is not a sort of window dressing going on. This is a genuine commitment. Thank you very much, Angus. That was great. Uh, Aisha, finally to you, and we have about two minutes before I start to wrap up. So you've got to put a lot of work that you did into really a very sharp response. You had the honor of being the coordinator uh, for the T20 task force on climate change and environment for the, the G20 Saudi presidency, as I mentioned. Can you just say, uh, tell us what are, were the key recommendations that came out of that? Just the first two or three. I know you produced a long report. Indeed, I've seen it, I've read it, but uh, just if you could just summarize maybe a couple of the key points in less than two minutes, please. <laughs> sure. So, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, indeed, it was uh, a great pleasure for me uh, and an honor to be a coordinator for uh, a task force uh, in T20 Saudi Arabia uh, with a focus on the climate change and the environment. And uh, throughout the year, in the preparation for the G20, uh, summit, uh, I, I had the pleasure to uh, witness many, many positive uh, things uh, in terms of bringing and embracing the uh, uh, climate and environmental issues in the region. Um, maybe I could highlight on how, um, uh, you know, uh, the leadership uh, in Saudi Arabia have been making uh, many statements when it comes to uh, the, uh, the energy transition, the climate and the environment. And this is, uh, uh, you know, it's um, uh, it might be surprising from the outsider when because we we think about the oil countries might not take a leadership in the climate and environment front, 
Um, and I think what the G20 has done, it has you know, raised the awareness uh, uh, about the climate and environmental issues in the region, not at the governmental level, but also at uh, different uh, uh, levels uh, of the stakeholders and uh, uh, for the citizens as well. Uh, I mean, uh, during that period, I haven't seen as much coverage in the media uh, uh, of the climate and environmental issue during that time. I haven't seen as much coverage uh, uh, before. Um, and I think also one important thing that uh, we should uh, highlight on is uh, the momentum that has been created in terms of establishing multilateral cooperation, not only at the regional level, but at the global level. Mm -hmm. So uh, based on that, actually, I think that the establishment of the Middle East Green Initiatives was actually built on the momentum that have been created last year uh, in the G20 Saudi Arabia. Um, in terms of the uh, major statements, um, now I don't remember much, although it didn't happen that far, uh, but the major thing that I could think of is the circular carbon economy approach, which has been endorsed by the oil in, uh, energy ministers, mm -hmm. G20 energy ministers. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a success for Saudi Arabia and the oil producing countries as well. Um, uh, and then uh, in the statement, there was support for the uh, green recovery as well. Um, so I'll stop here because I don't That's know. great. And you, you, did it, you did it in less than two minutes. So <laughs> in spite of Angus scoffing a little bit there, <laughs> it, it was great. And congratulations on the great work that you did in that area because, as I said, your report is, is uh, hugely impressive. Uh, we'll wrap up now because we, we always, we have uh, in all of our webinars, we try to begin on time and end on time because I know people have other commitments and other things to do. I would love to be able to carry on longer. We had loads of questions we could have asked, but maybe we'll have another opportunity. So maybe just to uh, finally to sum up, uh, on behalf of the Board of Directors of Bussola and on my own behalf, I'm really, really grateful to everybody involved in today's webinar. And of course, our very, very special thanks to Angus, to Dr. Arena and to Dr. Aisha. Uh, I thank each one of you most sincerely for your really invaluable contribution to today's engaging and enlightening discussion and for sharing with us your views and your insightful analysis. And I really do appreciate the time that you put into preparing for this and into, uh, into today. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful to, to every one of our large number of guests for attending. There's a lot of interest in this area for attending today's web webinar. And we look forward to seeing you all soon, hopefully with Irina and others in Square de Muse, hopefully in the, uh, after the summer. Uh, you know, I think we're all hoping and looking forward to that. I also want to thank the entire team at Bussola for their ongoing commitment and support. So thank you all very much. Uh, hope to see you soon. And in the meantime, take care.